Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I am your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. Uh, and today we are interviewing the passionate Giacomo Zucco. And Giacomo, before I ask how you're doing, I'll do my best to introduce you to our audience. Um, so Giacomo is an educator, entrepreneur, speaker and writer. Uh, and Bitcoin maximalist, I think it's fair to say. How are you doing, Giacomo? How's things going? I'm doing fine, thank you. I'm uh, still in Switzerland right now, but ready to travel again a little bit this summer, which is something I'm not doing as as uh, as much as I used to, so I'm quite happy. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to getting uh, getting out, I guess, out and about. I think, uh, I think we can all share that, uh, <laughs> that sort of want and desire. Um, so yeah, I guess, um, well, I've got a few things I wanted to, to talk to you about today and, and ask. Um, but I thought a good place to start would be um, kind of with uh, our RGB protocol, actually, um, as that's something that I know, well, essentially you're a big part of behind and, and obviously you're knowledgeable about. Um, and I figured there's probably a fair few people uh, in the audience who probably haven't, maybe haven't even heard of it or don't know much about it. Um, so and it's something that I discovered earlier this year, I think. So I'd appreciate if you could uh, give us like a little kind of, uh, explanation or a rundown of the concept um, just so that people out there listening can know what we're on about before we then go on to talk about you know different bits about it um, since sure. you're probably the best guy for that. <laughs> Gladly. So the first thing is a disclaimer. Uh, I am quite uh, knowledgeable about the initial idea because I was there when we produced the idea. So the general concept, the original concept is also part of, uh, uh, I, have, I had a part in developing it so I, I can justify it. The current development, of course, is something else because there is actually people writing code all the time and, and open source project, they take a direction which is, uh, uh, which is more close to the ideals and vision of people actually writing the stuff. So my vision of RGB that I will communicate now may be even a little bit restricted if you compare with what uh, the current developers like Maxine Morlowski or, or others are actually doing, which may be even more complex and uh, multifaceted. Uh, for me, it was basically like this. I had a client back, uh, it was just before uh, building on Bitcoin in Lisbon. So it was probably 2017 uh, or 18. I don't even remember. Basically, I basically had a client who uh, asked me to review uh, a token scheme for uh, some kind of token stuff. And my review was twofold. One was about the economics of the token. And I said it didn't make any sense. And I still stand by that. And I, I really cannot find many uh, schemes that make sense for so-called tokens, except for a very, very small set of exceptions. And um, the other part was uh, explicitly on the ERC20 over Ethereum architecture that had a lot of uh, criticalities in, uh, in our opinion. So we give this response and uh, the client said, okay, Let's assume that we have need for a token and we just disregard your opinion against it, at least about the architecture. If you have all this criticism about ERC20 uh, standard and you seem unhappy with uh, counterparty and Omni and, and colored coins, what is an actual design that you would actually uh, kind of uh, mm, suggest for a token scheme? Uh, if, you see that, if you say that ERC20 doesn't make any sense. So we hired the Peter Todd and uh, uh, back then there was also Ricardo Casata now is working on BDK. Uh, so a couple of developers and we, I'm not the developer myself. And we designed a protocol, mostly starting from Peter Todd's idea that I will now try to explain it a bit, which is uh, basically an idea that starts with Bitcoin, not with tokens. So uh, in Bitcoin right now you have node, full node, validating the rules of any kind of transaction graph you receive. When I send you Bitcoin, your node will check that signatures are, are, are correct, that, the, that there is no inflation, that the amount of, of Bitcoin you burn in the inputs is less than the amount, sorry, is more than the amount you, you, of UTXO you create in the output. So that, uh, that every block has the right rules, et cetera, et cetera. So you validate this. What miners do in theory is not validating again. In theory, they are just uh, uh, placing a cost to rewrite the history. So they are just creating a chronology of valid transaction. Validation is your responsibility. And miners are creating basically just a chronology of valid, uh, of valid transaction. 
The idea about Peter Todd is that it would be actually more efficient for privacy or scalability if miners didn't even bother checking the validity and they could just mine whatever. So blocks with even invalid transaction in, in between just everything, miners will just be charged to commit scarce resources, so energy and work on one version of the history. And then you will not be trusting them to keep validity rules enforced. You will just have to enforce validity yourself. And basically the idea will be when I pay you some Bitcoin, I will have to provide you a full chain of proofs from the origin from the coin base of signatures and scripts and stuff. I will send it to you off band. You will verify it off band and miners will just uh, uh, build block with the ashes of uh, the, the transaction just in order to make them non double spendable. Of course, there will be some complexities about the fee uh, management, but the idea will be miners will just build a history without any concern for what is, is, is included in the history and people will just uh, transmit peer to peer the validity history of Bitcoin. This will be have, this will have some advantages, uh, scalability, of course, a little bit, not much, but, uh, but sub substantial and also privacy, especially because uh, the public blockchain will not actually include any um, particular um, uh, detail, sensitive details about the transaction. They will just include these hash commitments and then within you will just receive peer to peer uh, the, the transaction, which will be closer to what happens with, I don't know, physical gold. There is better fungibility. I, I will just give you a physical gold bullion. It's not that everybody has, has to know it. You will just know it because I give it to you. And, uh, and this minor structure will just be needed to avoid double spending and that's all. So Peter had this idea for Bitcoin. Of course, it will not be possible to change Bitcoin to go like this because it will be too disruptive. But he said, if you want to do a token, like if you want to do a color a coin kind of project, uh, this is interesting because color a coin already is client side validated because uh, you, uh, the mine, like if you think about counterparty or Omni, these kind of meta protocols, the miners are not supposed to know what is the token logic at all, unlike in Ethereum. So it's better this way because in this way we can actually do a client side, we cannot do that for Bitcoin yet. Maybe someday we will do it with some kind of side chain pegging or something. But right now, if you really have to do a token, at least don't use the public blockchain to put their data that cannot be validated by miners anyway. So uh, like in counterparty, if I send you uh, a, a token, I will write the transaction of the token and the script and everything. And I will write that on the public Bitcoin blockchain, which is a waste because uh, uh, miners, of course, uh, will ignore those uh, internal uh, protocol rules, so these meta rules. They will just publish whatever uh, valid Bitcoin transaction, even if it contains an invalid uh, counterparty state change. So they will just publish everything and uh, you will just have any way to, um, to check yourself. You will, just, uh, you will just use the blockchain as uh, some kind of uh, paste bin public uh, data repository, which is a waste uh, for a blockchain, which is actually way more expensive and way more problematic. So uh, the idea was uh, just uh, do the token stuff, the token issuance, give the token information to your party, which is receiving, and just commit in order to avoid the spending to this transfer on a public blockchain, which a technique similar to open and stamp, a little bit compli more complicated. Uh, Peter called it a, a single use seal. So basically you, you, you close a single use seal on top of the transaction and the blockchain only includes the seal opening and the seal closing and not all the data. Of course, this design has a major drawback, a major problem, actually two. One is you have to keep backing up all the uh, off chain data yourself and your seed is not enough anymore to recover your tokens because if I send you a token, I also send you a chain of proofs, which is not very big, like it's, it's a way smaller than the amount of data we are transmitting right now over Zoom. It's smaller than a typical WhatsApp uh, or Telegram vocal memo. So it's super easy to send uh, from the point of view of, uh, uh, of uh, data bandwidth, but you have to store it because if you lose that, uh, you will lose all the tokens. You cannot just use your, uh, your Bitcoin seed in order to recover everything like you do on Bitcoin. And the second problem is 
you or your trusted counterparty or some trustless counterparty with some very complex design must be online in order to receive a payment. You cannot just give me an address and then go away because I need to reach you somehow to give you all the off-chain data. In Bitcoin blockchain, you just send an address, then you disconnect, you go to the jungle for three years, then you reconnect and you receive the Bitcoin. With this client-side validation, you need to stand there and, and actually receive my, my, pack, my, my package of uh, my payload of data in order to validate. And these were actually two drawbacks that were uh, actually um, uh, used as a counter, uh, as counterpart, as criticism of the design, as drawbacks of the design. But then uh, in, when we were discussing this, Lightning Network was just about to come on. And Lightning Network is interesting because it's much needed, it's useful, it works, it's the, the way forward for scalability, but it does have exactly the two same problems. You cannot just use your Bitcoin seed to keep your, uh, your Lightning Network, uh, um, your Lightning Network funds. You need to keep a backup of all your current state of a channel. Even worse, you don't only have to not lose the backup. You have to keep it secret because if you uh, if you leak some uh, past uh, uh, channel states, somebody can actually broadcast it to to punish you and to steal to, to to steal your uh, your stack in the channel. So you have to keep them and keep them secret. In RGB is simple because you just have to keep it, but not secret. And also you have to be online in Lightning, not just to receive, but also periodically to check that you're not being scammed. So you have to be online uh, every time you receive and also frequently just to check on the channels. In RGB is simpler. You just have to be online in order to receive and not anymore to check. So the, the UX challenges of Lightning are even worse that the UX challenges of client side validation. So we said, uh, let's just leverage the Lightning Network infrastructure. The client side validated data will be transmitted over Lightning like an extra payload of a Lightning payment. So we will reuse the fact that the Lightning nodes already have to exchange data. We will use that uh, to pass over the client side part. And we will leverage also uh, backup strategies of Lightning in order to backup or slightly modified in order to backup also your uh, client side data. Uh, data. And um, we, we said, so basically we said, we can use Lightning uh, solution to Lightning challenges to also solve every kind of challenges of, of this kind of client side validator design. And then we said, let's go further. Let's, uh, since we are already using Lightning, let's also create a Lightning channel, including uh, a known broadcast commitment to some, R, to some token transfer. So you, we can transfer the token without even going online. We can just transfer the token off chain. And, and then only when you do settlement of the channel, there will be a settlement on the token structure as well. So this was the start of RGB and I presented it in uh, Lisbon in a uh, building on Bitcoin. Uh, I also tried to give a, an attempt of justification of the possible legit use cases. So in my opinion, even if you don't have a legit use case for an RGB, I actually don't care because for me, this is an experiment for a general design for Bitcoin itself in the future. So if we manage to create a Bitcoin over RGB with some kind of two-way peg mechanism, then we have better privacy for Bitcoin itself. So it's, it's a, we can actually use it as an opt-in transition to a client-side validation model, which is interesting to me as a theoretical experiment. So I don't care even if 99% of RGB use cases are scammy. It's still a interesting design experiment. But furthermore, there may be some actually legit use cases. And I could mention basically uh, two. Uh, there, there actually was a third, but it was not re very relevant. The first one was collectibles. I was thinking, or, you know, rare pepes, uh, they are on counterparties. But it's bad because in counterparty, the, the first problem you have is that you're not sending the image of the frog. You are sending just the, 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 the signature on the hash. And then you have to maintain a public repository of the images of the frog like Pepe directory. So uh, this is just the same with NFTs uh, today. You have to maintain a public repository, maybe and maybe IPFS, but still you have to maintain uh, um, the, the data somewhere. And also this data must be public. So I cannot even say I created this artwork. I will send only to you the, uh, the, um, the like the high resolution version. 
and then you will be the only one not just having the signature but also having the the, the file itself then of course if you sell the file again and again there will be inflation in the number of people that that holds the, the the file itself but at least we can have like slow inflation like i can have i can send you a secret nft that only you have and then only the person that you will sell to and this will actually decrease the scarcity of the image but slower than with a public repository like ipfs or rare paper so in rgb i will actually include the image of the frog within the off-chain proof that i'm sending you of course i cannot put the image of a frog on a upper turn on a blockchain because it would be super expensive but i can just send it to you and use rgb just to commit and that will will work so uh, collectibles will be will be one one use case the other use case will, will be basically um uh, let, let's say uh, legal arbitrage uh, for secondary market for example tether tether is a company issuing usd credit basically but if they did that uh, it's completely centralized they can just decide not to give you the money back since it's centralized they can uh, the typical bitcoiner answer will be just use a database just use my sql why are you using using a blockchain if it's a centralized promise and the possible answer by tether which is a legit answer will be wait i'm forced to do kyc and aml and blacklisting when i sell tether to people buying it for tether corporation and when i'm redeeming dollar to people sending me tether back but in the secondary market people could just use this open protocol i have no control about and they could just uh, uh, they could just maybe uh, trade tether uh, to bitcoin in, without kyc without aml and i cannot be asked to stop it because uh, you see regulator i'm just using an open standard i can be asked to do kyc on the primary market but i cannot be asked to do that on the secondary market so there may be a point for some particular maybe you can have something similar on securities as well so it's it's more difficult but somebody could say the sec uh, wait uh, wait a sec uh, i can i can just sell my security to um to like uh, sophisticated investor certified uh, by the sec but then I, I don't know if they are doing something in the secondary market and this will be especially interesting with rgb because with rgb when you look at the blockchain you don't know if people are even exchanging on the secondary market you cannot know basically what you know is that if, if i send a, to a rgb token to you i know that i send it to you then if uh, ricardo sends that token back to me i know that somehow it went from you to ricardo but i cannot see uh, even exposed i cannot see what happened in between because uh, what we I, I omitted to mention another thing the idea was since we are sending the um, the proof of the past transaction chain the past the the, the, the past transaction dag we are sending it off band we can actually uh, use uh, uh, advanced cryptography like uh, bulletproof to actually uh, compactify history so that you will just uh, uh, see the net round and not every single passage so i i give a tether uh, usdt to you uh, lawrence you give it to uh, to somebody that gives it somebody that gives it to uh, julian assange that gives it to ross ulbrich that gives it to o osama bin laden or whatever then Osama gives, uh, who is not dead, but secretly living with Elvis in an island, is, uh, is giving that token to Ricardo. And Ricardo is giving the token back to me. Uh, dear regulator, I don't know what happened to the token. I cannot see it. It's not on the blockchain. I can only tell you that somehow the token that I gave to Lawrence is coming back to me from, by Ricardo. But in between, it's opaque from me, just protocol, protocol level, which would be interesting. Of course, it's not a guarantee of... Uh, uh, successful regulatory arbitrage because the regulators could just say, okay, they could just say, okay, you're forbidden from using this protocol. Uh, if you use this protocol, I just shut you down. But if you say, you know, it's like a global standard, it's like the internet, uh, I'm forced to use it by the fact that it's uh, everybody using it, maybe you can have some sort of, uh, of, um, of escape uh, uh, of plausible deniability. So these are two interesting use cases. And indeed, uh, originally, um, Bitfinex with Tether and, uh, and, and Bitrefill, actually, and another company which is called Fulgur Venture, and another company called Poseidon, they put some money in the development of RGB. Now, the current state, and then I finish this over 
long uh, first answer. The current uh, development is a little bit uh, getting more complex, even to me, because uh, the idea that the main the, 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 the prototype was developed by Alecos Fellini, but Alecos Fellini then went to work first for Blockstream and then for BDK, uh, Bitcoin Development Kit, uh, sponsored by Square. So now Alecos is not working on RGB anymore. And then Maxim Orlovsky took over and developed the, the, ma the major part of the code base. And he's also very much interested in complex contracts. Like uh, he's, uh, he's basically, his point is that what is, would be a bad idea to do on, on chain like with Ethereum. So having on chain miners validating complex compl uh, contracts with all the problems of front running like uh, the famous MEV discussion today, all the problems of scalability of privacy. You don't have those on RGB because everything is just peer to peer and off chain. So you can actually do special scripting languages and special virtual machine and do like something like Ethereum, but in a reasonable way. So he's taking more that complex direction, which uh, I'm fine with, but uh, I'm, I'm not really interested in contracts. And I, I think that people right now, the only contracts people actually use are multi-sig for, for security and escrow and uh, plus uh, occasionally some time lock uh, and lightning. But except for uh, uh, an atomic swaps for uh, atomic stuff like CoinJoin or CoinSwap. But except for these, uh, in, on Ethereum, people are not even using all that uh, super dangerous, super flexible uh, language. They are just issuing tokens and selling tokens to people. And people are trading tokens. And that's basically all it's happening, except for, uh, I would say, um, like uh, oracles on um, or stuff like uh, MakerDAO, which can be fairly reproduced with multi-sig because still it's a multi-sig with an Oracle. And then they're doing uh, uh, Uniswap, which is Atomic Swap, which is the same you could do in Bitcoin with uh, CoinSwap and stuff like that, uh, or Atomic Swap between Bitcoin and other stuff. So it, 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 people are not really using this uh, amount of complexity. So my, my, uh, my understanding and my interest is specifically uh, focused on the issuing something, transferring something, and, and getting it back with maximum privacy and maximum scalability possible. And uh, I'm, uh, so if, if I have to explain you the current uh, RGB code base, I'm not even able because it's, sup it's way more complex than my original vision. I still, uh, uh, I can just add one last thing, which is leveraging lightning to transmit the proof of chain is something that I think uh, the current code base is doing reliably. Uh, while leveraging Lightning for backup, I think that's not yet there because Lightning itself doesn't have yet a good backup standard. There are some plugins of C Lightning, some practices on LD, some centralized stuff on uh, Moon and Panix and, 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 um, and Breeze, but there is not yet a reliable standard for. Uh, decentralized backups, maybe based on your seed and stuff like that, which I was envisioning back then. So we will probably have to wait in order to leverage that as well. Gotcha. Thanks. That was um, yeah, that was a really good answer actually. There's a, there's a lot I kind of want to. There's a lot I've kind of been thinking of and like thinking to ask you. But um, yeah, I can see. I, mean, I guess I can see immediately how you could use uh, from what you've described um, RGB for like some form of synthetic assets, kind of like as you said with Tether, um, things like you could do gemstones and you could. Uh, create some kind of token that represents gemstones stored somewhere and then you can then you know people that can know that they can privately be sent that without anyone else knowing until you get back to the original um what impact will taproot and like the the advanced scripting that taproot's going to allow people to do with bitcoin transactions um how will that impact rgb uh it, it wouldn't really uh it will have it, it, negatively in the, in the sense that uh, now every wallet has to rewrite everything in order to uh, really exploit uh, the the big advantages of taproot which includes every lightning wallet so probably many lightning implementation will have to rewrite stuff from scratch and so probably rgb will have to follow that process and this could actually just delay the standardization uh, I don't think that RGB, that there is actually, if you search for it, I think Maxim Orlowski, the main developer of RGB, gave a presentation of Taproot and the impact of Taproot for, for Bitcoin and for RGB specifically. Uh, long term, there may be some, some actually good interaction. Uh, the, 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 I think that 
for me, uh, Maxim gave a very long list of interaction. For me, the main interaction uh, at equilibrium in the long term, long term is this. Uh, Taproot extend the problem of backups from Lightning to every kind of uh, complex Bitcoin, Bitcoin transaction. Because now, uh, like if you, do, uh, if you do some kind of complex P2SH script, and then you have your seed and also have the public keys of the other people, but you lose the script, you can still brute force it because basically the, uh, the, this, the, uh, the size of the script is, uh, is uh, there is a maximum. You can try to like, uh, uh, you can try the ordering of the public keys and then you brute force it and you recover it if it's standard. With Taproot, all the Taproot part, you have to back it up independently because there is no trivial way you could brute force it. In theory, it could be like super giant. So with Taproot, it will become a common practice that the user of complex scripts like multi-sig and stuff will have to back up their seed and all the Taproot script included the other XPUBs or the other uh, public keys, not just, uh, uh, not just their seed. So in a way, uh, your counterpoint to client-side validation is becoming stronger with Taproot because it's even more obvious that just the seed is not going to uh, save your Bitcoin in complex situation. Actually, this is um, so. This is something that has been discussed a little bit recently uh, online, and I've kind of been interested to see your thoughts on it based upon kind of what's just been brought up there. It's um, so I saw John Carvalho was talking about because um, he's building a wallet at the moment, I believe, or uh, is part of building a wallet. I mean, he's talking about essentially or complaining also about uh, that he felt the core devs, the Bitcoin core devs, were implementing too many new features, uh, which means they're going to they keep having to constantly rebuild things they've already done. Um, and he was saying essentially that he felt that uh, Bitcoin core and the developers should concentrate on making the software as lightweight and as dumb as possible so that people could build more using build more for bitcoin essentially and around bitcoin i didn't know what your like opinions or thoughts were on that because i know it's a bit of a kind of difficult topic to answer really um but i didn't know if you had any opinions on that obviously as it kind of imp impacts rgb to a degree uh, i do also in general not just for rgb and uh, it's not it's not a very uh is a conflicted opinion i think that in general uh, john's point is right uh, in order to have a protocol as a global standard, you need uh, stability of the base layer, not rapid evolution. You want evolution on the upper layers, but you want stability at the base layer. So it's okay if browsers keep changing, but uh, uh, HTTP should not change so much and the TCP IP should basically not change at all. And it's indeed is not changing since version four in the eighties. So it's stable. And even if it's not great, even if it has problems, like now we want to switch to IP version six because the space in version four is limited. So there are problems, but stability is, is even more important than, uh, than, uh, than improvement. Uh, the important thing is stability. So I think there is this point, And I think the base layers of Bitcoin, the ones that you use to, to, to build upon should get stable, which in a bad way is called ossified. But I think ossification for that kind of layer is good. It's not good for the whole stack. If, if all the project ossifies, that's bad. But if the base layer ossifies, that's actually good, especially in a politically sensitive stuff like Bitcoin, where there may be interest to influence developers to, uh, to, to, to uh, derail and hijack the development uh, towards more centralized choices or more uh, regulated choices or more censorship prone choices. So the fact that the base layer is uh, uh, unchangeable, untouchable, unevolvable, that's actually a positive. And I agree with John. And I agree with John that uh, there may be a perverse incentive for people who specialize over the years to actually only uh, change the base layer and design the base layer. So the better core dev, like I don't, I don't want to attack these people that I respect tremendously, but just to give an example, a Greg Maxwell, a SIPA, people who are actually, they are superheroes, they are wizards of designing uh, small but necessary changes at, at the base layer that evolve a Bitcoin up to now, they may have in the future pervert incentives because their specialization now is not building stuff on top. It's not even uh, cleaning up most of the people actually 90% of what they do is cleaning up and improvement of, uh, of efficiency. But they also have a strong 
um, some of them have a strong specialization in protocol evolution at base layer. And this specialization may be not needed by the real world eventually because we have to get to ossification uh, at the base layer. So there may be a fight where actually some categories of core developers, the ones specialized in protocol evolution, they will fight to push more stuff and, and the network will have to push against because we just want stability of something that works well enough. Where I may disagree with John is that, uh, but, but this is a very soft disagreement because who knows what is right. The, there is this trade-off because it, the point is, where do you stop? If you stop at the first version of Satoshi's client, uh, well, that sucks because they were like, they were bugs. So they were like a, a, a chain length bug. They were a lot of problems. Also, also eventually we'll have to fix the, you know, you will have to hard fork for the timestamp problem in, in, uh, in the distant future. So you cannot really uh, ch stop there. Uh, but you also can go uh, on forever because first you said SegWit is fundamental. And then we said, okay, yeah, but uh, now also L2 will be great for Lightning. But at this point, uh, maybe uh, Taproot, uh, and then Taproot is, is in now, that's great. But now I really want, for example, um, cross input signature aggregation. I think that once you already have a Snor signature, it will be great to aggregate Snor signature across input so you can actually incentivize people coin joining. So you may coin join less expensive than non coin join. So people will start to coin join for economical incentives and then you will have a great increase in privacy. Uh, so there are many reasons to, to, to say we're not there yet. Uh, also, the the infrastructure over Bitcoin is already huge and difficult to move, but not so huge. Like uh, it's true that nodes are not upgrading to Taproot fast enough, but they are kind. I, I mean, I'm not convinced we are already there, and I think that these last few changes uh, I will be. It will be still way better to have these changes than not. Also, because there is a, there is a trade-off. If you if you are too conservative now. Eventually, we will get to a point where it will be really impossible from an economic point of view to, to sneak other changes at the base layer because it will just be impossible. Right now, it's maybe still possible. So some fundamental stuff should be addable. But then Adam Beck is, uh, is answering to John in our Twitter debate. Adam is saying, okay, but what about simplicity? Simplicity is uh, a generalized script uh, which is safe, uh, uh, formally provable, which can be used even to build the new cryptographic primitives like Schnorr. So it's like the ultimate change that makes every other change uh, um, possible on top without changing the protocol anymore. So it's the last soft fork that will end all the soft fork. But then John says, but I mean, where are you going to stop? Uh, now Bitcoin works, Lightning works. So maybe let's just stop. Uh, so I agree with him in principle. I think we're not there yet. In particular, I want to see Lightning adopt. Uh, John is saying Lightning works, but in dark uh, in dark net markets, uh, people are using Bitcoin. Uh, there is this legend that people are mostly using Monero. It's not true. They're, they're, the liquidity is mostly on Bitcoin, but this is creating a problems for uh, fees, of course, because eventually using the settlement layer to do e-commerce eventually is doomed because the blockchain doesn't scale. So I would like to see dark net, dark net uh, uh, markets adopting Lightning, but Lightning privacy right now is pretty much, is possible in theory, but in practice it sucks. So uh, I think that for example, not just L2, but also switching to, uh, to elliptic curve points instead of uh, actual of time contracts, stuff like that must be done on Lightning. So anyway, we have to redesign Lightning. Uh, if, if not just for privacy. So uh, at this point, let's also sneak in L2 as well, which actually, which by the way, L2 will make uh, Lightning uh, looking very close to RGB because with L2, you do have to keep your last uh, um, uh, valid uh, state update, but you don't have to keep it secret. It's, it's, it's not a toxic waste anymore. And uh, uh, just like in RGB, you have to, to back up it, to back it up, but not to hide it. And also you will not, you will not need the watchtower anymore. Uh, with L2, you will have to stay online to receive, but you will not have to be online periodically to check because there is no punishment uh, 
there's no punishment transaction anymore. So uh, L2 will make a Lightning Network a little bit less problematic US-wide. So again, my opinion is conflicted. I think John is right on principle, but probably not on timing. I don't know if I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong and I'm over optimistic about the timing, but uh, I think it's good that there are the two, uh, the two uh, narratives right now. I think it's good there is somebody screaming, guys, when you're going to stop? And somebody screaming, please, please, just this last one. This is very good for Bitcoin. And I think the interaction between these two forces will actually create an equilibrium that will leave somebody unhappy. Maybe uh, we will have three short fork and simplicity and Adam will be very happy and John a little bit pissed because he will have to rewrite everything. And, um, and maybe, uh, maybe we will not even have anything after Taproot and then Adam will be sad and John will be happy. I don't know, but I think it's needed to have both concerns interplaying right now. Yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can understand that. So obviously it will get to a point eventually is the hope uh, from, from your side and I guess from mine anyway as well, that um, eventually the people screaming, okay, let's just stop now is going to get enough that it basically becomes the point that we get to a simple enough point of stage that we just halt and, and then start developing a lot more on, on different layers. Um, but that's interesting. I think... Um, to kind of bring up something that you said uh, much earlier in your first answer. Um, so, yeah, as, as you kind of said, uh, RGB is kind of developing uh, beyond what the initial vision was a little bit. So obviously kind of going for that uh, smart contract capability kind of Ethereum killerish kind of style. Um, and something you'd said when you had this company come to you to review, uh, it was a token on, uh, it was going to be the ERC20 token uh, from, from what you'd said. Um, what, I, I guess, what were the... Um, the issues that you had with Ethereum and with uh, them trying to use, like to make an ERC token, which then prompted RGB as an idea. What were those uh, weaknesses and problems that you saw at the time? Yeah, so first of all, Ethereum is an altcoin, which is not a question of, uh, I don't know, in, uh, philosophical purity, it's a practical question. Uh, an altcoin usually has a set of incentives that make me think that the current infrastructure will not be as is in a very few years, and it will have to rewrite everything, which is not even in a, a theory. With Ethereum, they, they already know that it's completely unscalable and they are already uh, basically uh, ruling, uh, they're already rolling out the beacon chain of Ethereum 2, which is even more complex and centralized. And, and so even if you like Ethereum 2, the point is you have to know that what you are building on top of Ethereum is not stable. So if you have to change it using a centralized developer group as a reference, just again, build your own database. You are not even building on an external stuff. So uh, instability, but then the, 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 the possible option would be, for, for example, correct coin on, on Bitcoin. And even those I didn't like, and Peter didn't like, and the other people with me didn't like, because even those are just like Ethereum, putting everything on chain. So uh, arguably uh, um, following Peter's logic for client side validation proposal, the less you put, but also following Lightning concept itself, the less stuff you put on chain, the better. The, the time chain, the blockchain is a beautiful invention, but it's super expensive, super bad for privacy, super, uh, it, it's, it's like precious. You don't have to waste it. You don't have to abuse it. You have to leave it for the absolute, absolutely necessary things. So if you follow these, everything complex, which is sensitive for privacy and also for minor front running, because if you do a complex contract on chain, then miners will mine blocks based on the, on the possible returns. It's like, you know, MEV. Uh, if you are a miner on Ethereum and there is some contract, you will mine blocks based on what you did on the contract in order to get more profit. So, uh, and you will censor. So there is, there, is a, there is basically doing complex stuff on chain is bad for scalability. It's bad for security with the front running. And it's bad for privacy because everybody else will see what you're doing. So every good innovation in Bitcoin is about, not every, but most good innovation in Bitcoin is about reducing the use of the blockchain. With Taproot, we take the script off chain and we only put in the spending script what we need and not everything else. With Lightning, we stay on ch off chain until we need to settle the channel. With RGB, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ethereum ERC20 is the complete opposite. Now they are in a confused way. They are backpedaling to the idea of layers. But the, the original concept of Ethereum was let's just 
uh, it, it was taking the color coin idea, uh, seeing that there was a problem that miners were not validating. That, like you take counterparty, you see that you have a problem. Miners are not validating counterparty rules. This is problematic because it means you cannot do hardware wallets in a simple way. You cannot do SPV in a simple way. So what you do is having the miners not just validating the, the Bitcoin transaction, but also any kind of complex contract. So it's actually the other way around uh, as a general design pr principle. Ethereum started as put miners in charge of everything and the global consensus in charge of everything. And the Bitcoin design was let's not put more stuff in charge of miners and global consensus, and if possible, even less. So ERC20 for me is the worst possible uh, um, case of protocol design for tokens. They, uh, they, so sometimes I, I may have a counter objection, which is standardness. Even a very, very, very bad design, if it becomes a de facto standard, is better than the alternatives just because it's a standard. So if everybody's, uh, I, I remember I had another client that uh, was asking me a, uh, like an opinion about what to use in order to issue tokens for tickets in an event. So they had this event and they wanted to, instead of just give tokens like QR code in an email, which would be all right because the event is centralized anyway. So you have to check it with the centralized party. So let's just issue a QR code to individuals. But they really wanted to do tradable tokens for the event for some kind of marketing reason. So they said, do we have to use uh, liquid uh, or uh, just because you are a maximalist? And I said, guys, uh, what kind of people are you inviting to the event? And they say, crypto traders. Uh, okay, these guys likely have a multi-coin shitty wallet. Yes, uh, I mean, use ERC20. Uh, it's just what they, will, what they will receive. Otherwise, you have to ask them to install liquid compatible stuff like Aqua or Green. I mean, why? This is just, uh, this, this is just nonsense to begin with. So it's just a marketing operation. Let's use ERC20. So if everybody uses ERC20 just because everybody else is using ERC20, then we can have a problem where a very bad standard becomes a, a de facto standard. And so even if it's very bad, you still use it, which is what's happening, for example, in my opinion, with the JavaScript server side. So, uh, so uh, um, browsers uh, use JavaScript. So a lot of web developers learn JavaScript. So now you have to do uh, server side stuff and you have a lot of cheap developers uh, already proficient in JavaScript. So you just use Node.js and then you try to fix all the problem with, uh, with Angular and TypeScript and stuff on top because the original design of JavaScript was not at all good for, for server side stuff. But I mean, it's standard, so now you do it. Uh, with Ethereum, I think that may happen maybe in the future, we're not there yet because if you think about that, yes, it is a standard, but this is all, only a standard among shitcoin traders which is a niche that is not overlapping with actual use. There is nobody using ERC20 for anything which is not ERC20 token trading. So it's a self-defeating standard. Uh, if you think about the future where shit coins are not as important, which is a future I think will come, uh, then the standard to trade shit coins is not that important. But maybe, for example, we can see an interesting phenomenon for uh, centralized stuff like Binance Smart Chain, instead of creating their own uh, token standard, they are just importing ERC20. So it's easier to, uh, to just adapt to support that because it's, uh, for example, if Bitfinex or Bitterfield had to manage uh, Binance Smart Chain, it's easier uh, from a technical point of view. You just, it's just the same stuff. You're just taking, all, taking out all the fake decentralization circles of uh, Ethereum miners and nodes and you're just replacing with proof of authority with Binance, which makes sense, except that it would be more honest to admit it's completely centralized. But at least is, I mean, if you have to centralize, paradoxically, it's usually better to completely centralize because the, the weakness of your protocol from the censorship point of view is the, is the weakness of the weakest link of, of, your, of your setup. So if your weakest link is going to make your protocol completely easy to censor, maybe it's better to just go full centralized and at least increase efficiency and increase UX or, or other stuff. Uh, so it, it, it's really difficult to, to be partially centralized. When you have a central point of failure, which is really a central point of failure, 
you are completely centralized. So you may just as well ditch mining circles and stuff like that and just uh, do uh, MySQL, uh, a public reviewable, publicly audi uh, auditable, auditable MySQL, which is basically was what these chains are. So to get back to your question, um, I think ERC20 may have some chance in the future to become a bad standard. I hope to avoid that. Part of the reason for RGB is to try to avoid this this topic future. Uh, but so far, that's not really the case for most uh, for most use cases. And the design of ERC20 is uh, everything goes on chain and everything is based on miners validating global consensus. Are you familiar with BISC's colored coin implementation for their BSQ token? Um, I wanted to know your thoughts on on the BSQ colored coin. I am actually. Uh, I said to, I said before that my presentation in Lisbon. I, I mentioned three uh, possible use cases. One was tether like stuff. One was uh, NFT like stuff, and one was BSQ DAO token. So it's. I think that the other reason you may have for the centralized protocol for tokens is to representing this kind of governance token or stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure. That, you re that, that a transferable token is not an overkill because probably you can have, I mean, double spending is not really a problem in a, uh, um, in a governance rights distribution. It's, there is not really the case where you, uh, where you send your governance right to somebody else, but also to somebody else, because it's, it's not trivial to trade high frequency governance rights. Usually there is very slow thing. So a public key, uh, a PGP-like structure may probably be used for a DAO without tradable tokens. It's probably an overkill to trade your reputation, trade your, your governance right, trade your author. Uh, I, I, I don't know if, if you get what I mean. That said, uh, they decided to go with tokens and the, that's also a legit use case because basically what's the problem? The problem is that there is some degree of centralization, the size, uh, the, the decision-making process in uh, in BSQ. If you just uh, have the developers making the, this decision, that's a central point of failure from the point of view of legal persecution of those developers. So the state can just come after them because they they, they cannot say like uh, BitTorrent designer, uh, I just designed this software. They they are actually actively uh, improving it and actively managing escrow stuff. So they actually. Uh, intervening in the protocol. So if you switch the governance right from known developers to uh, this kind of decentralized governance system, that is better. Uh, I proposed it to Manfred back then to wait for RGB uh, to launch the token, uh, but RGB was too slow to come out. And so they went with this correct coin uh, project. Uh, I, I mean, I will not push them to switch right now because the point is that the trading, the exchange part of these coins is not the important part. Uh, the important part is the burning dynamics, is the, is the decision making. It, they're, they're, let's say you have a iceberg of problems with this kind of DAO design and uh, how to transfer the, the token is the small tip of the iceberg, which is not really essential. So they can just use whatever they are using now. If RGB becomes uh, a standard, I don't know, in 10 years, a de facto standards that everybody uses, it will be trivial for DAOs like BSQ to move to RGB. If not, I mean, it's okay. It, 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 it's not really fundamental. I guess that a rare Pepe collectible will have more benefits switching from counterparty to RGB uh, or to AS20 to RGB than a BSQ uh, DAO token will have. So it's, uh, it's another use case I'm very interested in, but the, not, the challenges are, are way more, way deeper than the token transfer problem. Something I, um, well, I, I, I've got a lot more I want to ask, but I, I'm aware that time is uh, running slowly to, uh, well, quickly to, to the end. So I, something I wanted to ask you, that kind of pulls away a little bit from the technical side of things and more towards the kind of moral or opinion side of things, just to something a bit different. Um, was something uh, that I saw 
uh, on Twitter the other day uh, was Max Hillebrand talking about um, the Bitcoin law. And this is to do with El Salvador and what's going on there. Essentially, he was saying that, that, that it was bad for the El Salvador merchants and entrepreneurs and kind of went on to explain that the way he saw it was that uh, if someone's a merchant and they want to receive US dollars, um, then and they kind of clearly want dollars over Bitcoin, they don't understand Bitcoin, they don't see the benefit, whatever it is. Um, to force him to then give away his goods to receive Bitcoin instead of dollars is obviously uh, well, not a good thing, essentially. And, and he said it was a decrease in the um, in his subjective value scale, I think was the way he put it. So I don't know. Um, I don't know if you, if you had like a, an opinion on this, because it seemed like Max kind of got ratioed on, on that, really. There was more more comments than likes. Uh, so I didn't know if you had a what your opinion was on that, because I thought it was a little bit of a sort of different topic, really, to, to see what you thought. Uh, like with John, I really appreciate uh, it's another case where I don't I mean, I usually have very strong opinion and I express them in a very strong way. And you picked two questions where I actually am more nuanced because uh, so one, as a general principle, I agree that top down uh, central planning decision are not the way to go for Bitcoin adoption. So it's not about one government deciding, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so as a principle, every move that is coming bottom up from, from people forcing the government, not withstanding the government will be more anti-fragile, more, more, uh, more resilient and more, uh, well, resilient and even anti-fragile and more uh, uh, reliable and more uh, long-term oriented uh, than any decision which is central, centrally planned. So centrally, central plan is bad for money, including legal tender for Bitcoin. That said, uh, that's as a general principle. That said, then I said, okay, in this case though, we are talking about the small economy of people that are suffering for uh, US inflation without getting uh, the, the Fed uh, hands out. So uh, they, are, they are losing purchasing power because the Fed is printing, but the, at least the Americans are receiving a small amount of this uh, printed money and they are not. So they're just suffering exported inflation. Plus they also, uh, their economy is heavily rely, relying on, um, on remittances and they are suffering a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, free, uh, uh, rent seeking from uh, money transmitters. And there is not a trivial, uh, and, and, and getting out of this circle is difficult because, okay, just use Bitcoin, but then your uh, Salvadorian uncle will not know how to sell Bitcoin locally. So there is a friction there. And now with this law, they can just go to the grocery shop and they will accept Bitcoin. So my, my, my idea would be central plan, bad. This specific central plan over a limited population with uh, this kind of specific problem, may be not the worst kind of central planning I've seen so far. Plus, it's very funny. I mean, I can, see, I can say that something is bad, but also fun, like, uh, you know, volcanoes mining. These are very good memes. So, uh, no, no, so let's say, practically speaking, I don't see many people getting hurt for uh, this choice of, uh, of policy. I don't see really the exchange, the, the, the merchant being uh, uh, thrown in jail in El Salvador because of this. And I will tell you a little bit more about specifics of the law. So there is not actual harm I can imagine on a concrete human being, it's just the principle. And on the other hand, the central planning was somehow not that bad in this case, especially com compared with other central planning. I don't want to enter this, this, uh, this kind of worms, but, um, but the, the same country at this draconian COVID restriction, which I think hurt merchants way, way more than any kind of legal tender law. But then said, uh, so, General principle, bad. Specific situation, I mean, not much to lose and something to gain for those people. And then uh, George Selgin interacted with me, the economist, the free banking economist, interacted with me on, on Twitter and said, okay, but even if you are going to push for adoption, the wording of the law is very bad because Article 7 says that you, you are forced to accept Bitcoin. So before, people were only forced to accept dollars which was bad already. Now they're forced to accept dollars or Bitcoin. They're increasing the amount of force on individual. But then some people pointed out that that was a, a, there was a strangely written law as typical for politician. There are article eight that also says that if you have the government provided infrastructure, you can receive Bitcoin and change inst instantly 
with two dollars and receive dollars in your traditional fiat uh, method. Uh, so you, if you do have that infrastructure, you can just use it for free. Of course, free stuff from government. There is always always some trick, but you can use it for free. So you're basically it's like you didn't even receive Bitcoin. And there is Article 12 that says that if you do not have, for some reason, the government provided infrastructure, uh, which is handedly out for free, but you cannot have it because for, because it's not practical, you don't have the internet, then you are not forced to comply with Article 7. So basically, uh, I mean, feel free to tag Max with this because we never had the, 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 the way to discuss it. But the actual law at the end is you don't want it, just don't install the app, don't have an internet connection with the app, or, or just say that you couldn't exchange the app, and the laws explicitly uh, uh, excuses you from having to accept Bitcoin. Do You do have the infrastructure, change with Bitcoin. Uh, sorry, change with dollars, if you prefer dollars. Or just accept Bitcoin and, and don't have fun staying poor uh, with, the, with, the, with inflating dollars. So, again, uh, philosophically, I'm not a fan of, uh, of uh, central planning and government adopting Bitcoin. On one side, it was probably inevitable, so we cannot really fight that. Uh, and there are other more urgent fights, even when we have to fight El Salvador government. There are way more urgent problems with that. And, uh, and, and also the specific design of the law, I'm sorry to say, because I don't like politicians, I don't like bureaucrats, I don't like central planning. But it's not that bad. It's a little bit convoluted. But when you actually analyze it, the, I think that the, the first time I will see a cop, uh, I don't know, uh, jailing somebody because they're not willing to accept uh, Bitcoin from a guy on a, on a grocery shop, I will be uh, on the front line with Max saying that's very, very bad. That's terrible. That's the opposite of what Bitcoin stands for. If I had to say that I find that scenario likely considering the law and considering everything uh, you know also during this slow phase of price discovery most people will not even spend bitcoin i mean even with this law most people will just send dollars back to el salvador and most people will just uh, and if people will uh, if the salvadorian uncle uh, will receive some dollars and some bitcoin they will probably uh, uh, keep hold of the Bitcoin and spend the dollars instead if they are re uh, if they are rational. So uh, I don't I don't even think there will be a single occasion of violence in this case. I agree that culturally speaking, we should not be over uh, over excited about cent Bitcoin will not be adopted by decree. That's the opposite of what Bitcoin stands for. So. Stuff like El Salvador may be inevitable. I think it will expand, maybe in this cycle, maybe in the next two, maybe Panama and other countries that are just suffering from external dollarization uh, and, and high remittances uh, volume. It's already, I mean, the Philippine Islands also have solved part of the remittance problem without any legal tender law, just because people in the Philippine Islands started to actually uh, accept Bitcoin a lot because there is a lot of people sending Bitcoin back to the Philippine Islands. And so it's happened naturally, which is better. In El Salvador, it happened more forcibly. But again, I, don't, uh, I will be with Max against every single case of specific violence against an, a no-coiner in El Salvador. I understand what you're saying, definitely. I, I think I, because this is the thing for me, I've got quite like libertarian beliefs, I guess, uh, I have to admit. So I, I always find it quite tough to accept, you know, like someone says you're forcing someone to accept Bitcoin, especially when, you know, some people are just aren't going to get it for a fairly long period of time. Uh, it's kind of understandable, you know, um, for various reasons, cultural beliefs, education, whatever. Um, so yeah, I can see where you're coming from there. Um, but then, yeah, as I say, I, I, I kind of, I, yeah, I understood it that, you could convert the Bitcoin immediately into dollars using the government infrastructure. So it kind of made me feel a little bit better about it, um, which uh, uh, it sounds like did the same for you. Um, there's, yeah, there's more I wanted to ask you, but um, I'm aware we're running uh, long on, on time. So um, yeah, I think I can do 20 minutes more, not more than that, though. It depends if you still have time. So, um, yeah, amazing, amazing talk so far. I've, I, there's so much to unpack, but I have something a little bit more, um, a new to topic, basically. So. What are your thoughts on the Bitcoin Mining Council? You know, it's, it's, it may look like a nothing burger at the moment, but do you see these people as, as people who have some kind of um, 
hero complex, oh, we're here to save the day. Um, and do you, do, you, do you think that we could see a repeat of the said with 2X and New York agreements type of thing in the future with this um, the emergence of the Bitcoin mining council? Very good question. I think it's something in between El Salvador and, uh, and uh, uh, Segwit2x, meaning that uh, uh, on one side, it's, uh, it's a top-down top uh, centralized uh, central planning designed to save Bitcoin, which is already a failure in principle. If Bitcoin needed centralization to be saved by something, Bitcoin had failed. Uh, this is not true, for example, at the beginning. Without Satoshi as a central point of failure, there will not be Bitcoin. But then the point of Bitcoin is that the central point of failure that was necessary at the beginning uh, gradually got, got dismissed. And now we don't depend of any individual action, any hero, any savior to fix Bitcoin. If we do, that's the real problem. Uh, it's the same problem with the, um, the uh, let, let's say, the Bitcoin Foundation with Gavin. And, uh, and later on also when me and Adam Beck and Elena and Slash we, we, and Will Panda, we proposed the B Foundation uh, uh, as a new way, as a, sim, as a stuff to just funnel donations actually, but we generated a strong reaction against it by the community, which I understood and then we backed off and we said, okay, let's just funnel donation individually without uh, this kind of centralization of the narrative. So uh, there is a centralization point uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, Segwit2x and New York Agreement, this is not really proposing yet any change to the Bitcoin protocol. So I don't feel any, that there were, like Nick Carter was saying, the new, uh, the new civil war will be on uh, 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 miners enforcing uh, energy sources mix. I don't think so. There is no civil war because, the, the, as you said, Right now is mostly a nothing burger, just a few people on a Zoom uh, chat. I mean, just like us here, we can we can say we are now the great uh, bit refill council, bit refill podcast council. I mean, I mean, okay, we are. We, we, doesn't matter. So we are the same. They are they're just the same. But in perspective, uh, they could become an active lobby. Uh, but still, until they don't push for any kind of uh, um, block censorship, like. Uh, we are not going to mine uh, transactions that are not uh, from people who are, I mean, we are, we are blocking uh, climate denier transactions. That, that, would, be, that would be a problem. Uh, until it's just uh, the, the will to coordinate, to expose their specific energy mix in order to convince people that Bitcoin is not really going to, to uh, burn the oceans, um, I mean, it's, it's okay, it's not really, I don't consider that a, a issue. Uh, the difference with El Salvador would be that this is better because at least there is not a legal mandate, it's not a, a law, it's just some people mm, gathering for something. It's worse because the content of El Salvador laws, at least, I think it's reasonable. People accepting Bitcoin directly in order to, uh, to route uh, over uh, remittance fees and to route over inflation, that's reasonable. I think the content of this energy mix disclosure is actually non-reasonable. I, I am a physicist and as a physicist, I think the whole thing about uh, uh, renewable sources of energy is, 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 is a bunch of green energy is a, bust, a bunch of physical nonsense. Uh, thermodynamically speaking, there is just free energy and when you use it, you create entropy and you just lose it and you consume it. And uh, so eventually we run out of free energy uh, from the environment. But before we get to that, we have to become a type three uh, galactic civilization before you run out of all the free, freaking free energy we have in atoms with, with fixed uh, nuclear fiction and everything and fusion and whatever. No, um, so I think the more the civilization advances, the more the civilization will ask for free energy because that's what the civilization does. It transforms the environment. And the most efficient, the, the, most, the, the higher demand you will have for energy, the most efficient you will have the providers trying to be in order to compete. So miners will try to provide more hashes with less energy because energy is expensive for them. So all these, and also ultimately what we're using is just basically solar energy with the exception of the volcano in El Salvador, it's all solar energy because when you, when you burn uh, carbons, 
basically you are just burning chemical energy which was precedently created via photosynthesis by solar energy it's all freaking solar energy even hydroelectric is is the the sun heating up water uh, which will just end up in a higher gravitational potential and now it's coming down and you are extracting the this, you are leveraging this difference it's all solar anyway uh, to fixate on uh, of photoelectric uh, as a only kind of solar which also has a lot of environmental problems i, I understand that photoelectric is cool because people uh, immediately understand that we are using this giant nuclear source on the, on, the, on the sky, which is free and it's wasted, and we are using that, and which is very, very good. But it's just very easy to understand that the, photo, that the photo, uh, photoelectric panel is doing that. But every other source is also leveraging that same uh, reaction. Of course, hydrocarbons, they will run out because we are burning them fast, in a faster fashion that, we are, that, that they are creating. Uh, but price dynamics will likely fix that if a, a, an energy resource a energy source yeah, or a free energy source is become become scarcer the price will increase compared to other you don't have to subsidize you don't have to scream you just have to uh, you just have to let prices work of course if uh, uh, prices don't work when you have some kind of uh, crazy externalities so you make somebody else pay for your lunch uh, but this is not really the case with oil and carbon. People who are, who are using oil and carbon, will have, when oil and carbon will end or become scarcer, people will have to pay uh, to, to do that, except for government that gets that for free because they just expropriate it from people. There is the CO2 uh, scare. Personally, I think it's usually overblown. Uh, I think that there is, there are, I mean, I don't want to open yet another can of worm. But I just tell you, as I, as I think it is, without getting further into the debate, I, I completely agree that I'm in the minority here in the scientific world. But I think that uh, uh, CO2 emitted by the fossil, carbon fossil uh, fuel increasing may have a causal relationship with uh, the temperature changes. I think that that's not really proven, but entirely possible. I think that it's highly dubious to think that this effect is, uh, is um, uh, basically dominant over other effects for the, same, for the simple reason that uh, temperature was way higher in the past where we didn't have so much CO2. And CO2 was way higher in the past where there were no industries to produce it. So the, it's, it's way more complex. And to think that the simple thing like how much CO2 we are, we are producing is the only dominant dynamics to, to actually uh, create the greenhouse effect. I mean, it's, it's a little bit complex, but let's assume that. Let's assume I'm on board. I'm a little bit skeptical about this simplification, but let's say I'm on board. To think that uh, this kind of change will create super linear changes in our temperature in the world, uh, it needs a very, very subtle theory that is completely unproven. So you need, so basically a greenhouse effect is sublinear. The more CO2 you produce, the less effects you have on temperature. And in order to make it super linear, you need CO2 making water in the ocean evaporate faster and water is the prevalent actual uh, greenhouse gas. So you need this kind of chain reaction with, I mean, okay, let's, let's, let's assume you have that. But then you have the fourth assumption, which is this change will be fast and catastrophical. And I think this is completely unscientific. Uh, every change of this, this kind will be likely over decades or centuries. And there is way more part of this planet that are too cold to be inhabited and cultivated than parts that are too hot. And even if you account for the increase on ocean levels that are basically wiping out part of the land, uh, paradoxically, a warmer heart, uh, a warmer planet would be better for human beings uh, uh, over the long term if you have time to adapt and if you have time to switch production and housing and stuff like that. And last, lastly, even if I assume that everything like this is true and we are going to have a, a climate uh, uh, greenhouse effect catastro catastrophe, catastrophe, maybe not because of sea of temperature, but because of disasters caused by temperature, because hurricanes and stuff. I mean, this is highly dubious, but anyway, even if that's the case, to think that political laws 
like uh, carbon uh, emission laws can actually fix that with central planning. I think that's an economic fallacy. Uh, if there is a problem, uh, the only way to fix the problem is to cooperate freely in the marketplace, producing innovation, producing stuff, sensi producing sensitivity in people. So like uh, it's good culturally to have the discussion, but the idea that you have uh, the carbon credit as a solution, I think that's economically retarded. So for all this reason, the content of this green mix uh, uh, rhetoric, I think is mostly nonsense. Let's say it again, uh, the guys want to play with, uh, with that as long as they're not going to push changes to the protocol to, to fit their narratives, let them play. What's your preferred lightning wallet? And how do you feel about privacy wallets like Wasabi wallet? Uh, I have to admit first that for some random reason, I never really got into Breeze. I've been told Breeze is great. I have Breeze. I just didn't have time. For some reason, I always postpone. I, I know the CEO, I like the guy. And so I would love to explore Breeze more, but I didn't. So right now I'm really exploring a lot of the, those kind of, uh, what I use mostly for my lighting stuff is Zeus connected with my C lighting node. So it's not even a lighting wallet. It's just a remote for my lighting node. That's what I mostly use. But I'm, especially for noobs that don't have a lighting node at home, I am especially trying to understand the UX challenges and the UX trade-offs in a partially centralized wallet, non-custodial but centralized wallet, like, for example, Phoenix and Moon, which are the two things I'm, I'm watching more. I think there is, I, I think they are great. Uh, they are the right direction. I think that the best will be to have uh, the uh, the back end of Moon and Phoenix Eclair, respectively, open source and easy to deploy, just like uh, you know, Umbrel Node or Dojo or uh, or uh, My Node or Raspberry Blitz, to have this kind of easy spin up a Phoenix um, a Phoenix uh, back end, and then a very easy pairing mechanism. Just scan this QR code and you are paired. And then it will be cool to have one single wallet uh, being able to be paired with several equivalent servers doing all the function and paying this server just right now when you do uh, uh, atomic swap in or atomic swap out or trampoline node path discovery or watchtower function or backup function you pay uh, well actually just for the swap basically but in principle you pay moon and you pay eclair for their centralized service. So the, the greatest thing would be to have, uh, like, I'm a, let's assume I'm a clear. I, I, I roll up a mobile wallet like Phoenix and a free open source one click install after verification of the signature uh, Raspi Blitz like node. And uh, if, you get, if you add me, you will pay fees to me when we do atomic swap in, atomic swap out, trampoline node, backup channel. Uh, uh, or, or whatever, or liquidity providing like Bitterfield Thor to, to give you income, uh, like inbound liquidity. But if you install your friends or family node, if you pair with your fam friends or family node or another node or another company, you will split the payment to me and them. And so you will be, you, you will be incentivized to have uh, many servers and the servers will be incentivized to be run because they will make money out of being server. So this kind of semi-centralized design, I think that would be super dangerous for the base layer, but for the upper layer where there are smaller amounts involved, I think it's, it's a good kind of small centralization. It's a po it's, it could be like, a, uh, it will not be a centralization like single point of failure. It will be like more many islands of small centralization for efficiency. And if you just uh, take down one, no money gets lost and you just lose time and you just lose UX and you have to switch to another server. So that will probably be the best. But so I'm, I'm following the experiments with uh, uh, Phoenix and when people ask, and, and Moon, and when people ask me which one to start trying with, I usually either sell, uh, well, actually sometimes I just say Blue Wallet because it's custodial, but it's very, very good. And uh, so if, if you want to try, uh, the, the important thing is to be honest with the trade-off, I say, you can use Blue Wallet. You just have to know that you are just asking other people to do lighting stuff for you uh, as long as you trust them and as long as that's legally viable, unless you switch it to your node with BLW, which is probably something you are not able to do yet. 
if you just want to do something in between, there is Phoenix and Moon and probably Breeze, which I want to look, uh, look into more. Uh, I do mostly push for Lightning for mobile wallet. I don't think that mobile wallet for, for, for cold storage makes any sense at all, almost. I, do, I don't use mobile wallets without Lightning anymore, actually. So now, Samurai, uh, I had like a, a Twitter fight with Samurai uh, last uh, week. Uh, I used to love the wallet, but I started to actually uh, fall out of love with the wallet, mostly because the anti-Lightning attitude. I think that uh, Lightning is not perfect. Light Lightning has many problems, and we have to fix those problems. But just going full on chain, uh, as, as that was something reasonable the long term, I'm sorry, but it isn't. The blockchain cannot scale. So uh, if you don't like Lightning, fix it and do something better. But there is no way you can onboard people on chain for long because the, the, the time chain doesn't scale by design and by definition. Also, all the privacy problems we are trying to fix are also created by the abuse of global consensus on chain. So Lightning, uh, if, if we a, a, a good a good design of Lightning may even be way more private than current on-chain transaction. Of course, this is not the case right now because the current designs are not really optimized for privacy, but it, it may be. So a mobile, especially if you are focusing on a mobile wallet, uh, assuming that fees will go higher and people and like poor people in Venezuela will not really be, uh, uh, they will probably stop doing on-chain transaction most of the time and it will switch to layer two transaction anyway for price dynamics. So just let's focus on understand how the, for example, Phoenix is a, is a, uh, is a problem for, uh, for privacy because you are connected with the centralized server. So there is Tor, which is optional and we should probably push for Tor as default and blah, blah, blah. And then when you create a channel, maybe you can do a pay join to create the channel and a pay join to close the channel, which will basically break the trivial connection. And then eventually Lightning will evolve with, uh, with the liquid point stuff and, and stuff like that. So that will be the way. And I think Samurai Wallet is not following that way. And, um, and uh, also I think that uh, Samurai Wallet is, well, my, 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 uh, start of the fight was when I wrote a paper, uh, a lot of paper, a treatise, an article on, uh, on B Bitcoin Magazine, which is mentioning the importance of privacy in Bitcoin as fundamental and uh, CoinJoin as a very, very important best practice. And I mentioned three uh, CoinJoin implementation. The one I use, which is Join Market, uh, the one I do suggest, except that it's very, very difficult as UX, so most people are not able to run it because of UX challenges. The one I don't use, but I like, which is Wasabi, which is a centralized but blind uh, mixer uh, invented by Nopara with the Chamel link. And then I mentioned Whirlpool, which is the mobile based um, uh, fork of Wasabi basically, which uh, with small changes to make it more uh, reasonable to mobile and stuff like that. And then I was attacked by Samurai people because I also mentioned the other two which are broken and sent people in jail, which is absolutely not true. So the, the problem with this team is that they are basically reacting to any competition as, uh, as is like a huge uh, scandal, while actually there are trade-offs. For example, the trade-off with Wasabi uh, is that you have this, uh, um, yes, it's easy, it's easier than it was in, in Whirlpool to mess up with post-change, uh, post-mix, post uh, change and post-mix uh, uh, OTXOs. It's easier to mess up. Uh, not really easy, but easier. In, Waza in Wasabi is more difficult. The second problem is that for it's not mobile and for them, uh, everything must be mobile. And I'm not sure I agree about, as I said to you, I'm not sure I agree that everything must be mobile of on-chain part. Hi. And, um, uh, and the other, <laughs> he escaped. And the other, so we started to fight and I understood why uh, basically most of the Bitcoin developers from uh, Luke Dashir to Greg Maxwell to Nicolas Dorier to Nopar itself, who is the guy who invented the, uh, the, um, the, the kind of uh, coin join Samurai is using, they actually cannot stand this team anymore because they are like, uh, I, I think they are just hypersensitive. I think that they are, um, I, I was back, I was uh, promoting them 
with shorts and, and suggestions at the beginning. But I think that they have their heart in the right place. They want to fight hard with privacy. But I think that it just happens that their technical competence, especially at the backend level, and they, they have great UX. They are, they, I think it was one of the world with the best UX. They're also very good at marketing. They like to pretend that they are serious tech people against marketing people and marketing influencer, but they are great at marketing. They, they are very good at brand, name of the features, uh, explaining of the feature. Most of the best educators are actually around the, the samurai community, like Bitcoin question and answer or uh, Open Noma, other, other people. Are, many people are around their education brand and it works great. So UX, education, branding, uh, marketing, they are great at that. But unfortunately, I think that their technical skill on the privacy sensitive stuff in the background, in the, in the back end, were not matching their ambition. So they just messed up a, a few times. The first time when they came out with blockchain.info API as the background. So that was not good for privacy. And the second time when they, they adapted the Wasabi design to mobile, but now their central server could actually see all the UTXO and the, uh, of, of the people involved. So it was, there was no point to have a Xiaomi uh, coin join if you can see everything. Then they fixed that. They run on Dojo, uh, where you can actually have a, your full node just like in Wasabi. But before it was, it was a problem. And even now, if the majority of people uses uh, the centralized server, the few people using Dojo, if, if they are a minority, they are still exposed to, to, to basically complete link by the server. So you are hiding from external observer, but not from internal observer. And you are forced to just assume good faith, which is not the point of a privacy wallet. And, uh, and then they had some problem in the Tor implementation that green address, green developer uh, disclosed and they fixed it. But every time there is something which doesn't work in, in their software, they overreact, uh, just claiming to be uh, persecuted and oppressed. And I think this created a, a sort of uh, uh, alienation with most uh, Bitcoin developers. And so now I think uh, they are forced to uh, pander to another uh, constituency, another target, which unfortunately uh, it's uh, uh, shit coiners. Uh, I, 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 there, there will be like another hour to discuss about Monero here. I think that Monero can be a privacy tool and can be used by people to increase privacy. Uh, unlike most shit coins, Monero has a real world utility right now. But I also think that this reasonable sentence had been twisted over the past years into just use Monero and you are safe. So you have Bitcoin, just buy Monero, transact with Monero, and then your privacy is fine. And I think this is a very dangerous narrative because most of the time, a trivial Bitcoin swoop. So if my merchant on the dark net web wants to hold Bitcoin long term, and I want to hold Monero long term, if we do something trivial like just move Bitcoin from my cold storage to an exchange. Centralized or, or non-centralized, it doesn't matter. The, the centralized swap case is even worse because you have a public um, uh, order book. So you, you change Bitcoin with Monero. You lose privacy in the swap because there is a liquidity bottleneck and an anonymity set bottleneck in the exchange. Then you transact with Monero, but Monero doesn't have an infinite anonymity set. The anonymity set is reduced to the ring signature and mitigated by the amount, the correlation, but still it's very limited because fewer people use Monero so that you have basically a fewer anonymity set, a fewer liquidity, and you're limited to the ring signature. And then the, the merchant had to swap back. Typically, if you go through this bottleneck of liquidity, you, re, you, you may very often reduce your anonymity instead of increasing it. So the typical simple narrative uh, Bitcoin privacy is broken, just use Monero. I think it's completely, uh, it's completely wrong. Uh, if everybody used Monero as a store of value, it will just crash because it's completely unscalable because you have a structure based on spent output instead of unspent output and because you have obfuscation on top of blockchain. So Monero cannot scale, even worse than Bitcoin base layer. And it's not trivial to build upper layer. So you cannot just everybody switch on Monero as a, as a store of value. And if you use Bitcoin as a store of value and all you occasionally use Monero as a minority thing spot, you may actually decrease your privacy. So now the Samurai wallet people, they, are, uh, they, they have a problem basically. When you 
uh, in order to uh, increase the effectiveness of coin join you should use at least for now there are some other designs but for the typical design created initially by nopara that samurai is using you have to have fixed amounts so uh, so wasabi whirlpool has three pools with decreasing amounts and then you end up with a change that you cannot you cannot mix anymore and so what you will do with this is maybe to swap it atomically to something else the, i think the most reasonable thing would be to swap it with other bitcoins so you just do something called coin swap where you just swap this and nobody can follow anymore but uh, samurai instead decided to 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 do an atomic swap with the monero altcoin where actually you have to support two completely different architecture and you have to go through a market exchange problem and a market exchange liquidity bottleneck that you will not have with CoinSwap. CoinSwap. Also, you will have all sorts of, you know, uh, problem, uh, price volatility problems like uh, American free call option, free American call option problem with between Monero and Bitcoin. You have a lot of problems created by the price volatility, which you will not have if you just coins, uh, coin swap at Bitcoin with Bitcoin. And I think that the, the reason that Wasabi made this prayer, of course, an easy response to me would be uh, just fork it and do it yourself. I mean, you, I'm criticizing somebody else instead of doing the work, which is fair. I, I, I am. I just think, I mean, you are doing something. I'm not doing that. And I'm just saying your choice is wrong. I, it's just cr criticism. And, um, and I think that the, I suspect the reason to do this is not because it te technically makes more sense, but because right now the fan base of the very strongly minded and vocal uh, fan club of, uh, of uh, Samurai is actually merged with this kind of uh, uh, altcoin community within Monero that thinks that you just switch to Monero and your privacy is fixed, which is absolutely not the case. And so I took, uh, um, um, I took an old tweet by Samurai that say that uh, if they ever added any altcoin feature, uh, they would be considered to be considered compromised. And then I push, I, I put these together with the new uh, tweet where they are supporting uh, the, the the Bitcoin side of the atomic swap with Monero, and uh, and I just put that like uh, how it started, how it's going, and they were super offended. And I, I think that uh, well, okay, there are many personal things that I don't want to enter in, but I just. I, I'm just, um, let's say I was in love with Wasabi, uh, sorry, with Samurai, and I'm not uh, anymore. And you know, when the love story ends, there may be some bitter feelings, and that's probably the case here uh, in, on my side. I, I'm not claiming that they were ever in love with me, uh, probably not, but I was, and, and now I'm not, and that usually sucks. It's a true, true heartbreak story of uh, 2021, I gotta say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, thanks. I uh, God, I appreciate your answers. And uh, I, hey, I, I, th I think there's a lot more to ask. I think maybe even a, a part two sometime later this year could be could be really useful if you if you're ever uh, open to it. But um, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, we definitely should wrap up because the time is uh, is ticking by. But um, it's been fantastic, and uh, I've learned a lot already. Um, and some new kind of. Uh, ways to criticize uh, ethereum for me as well which is great um and so yeah i really appreciate uh yeah coming on and, and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us um and yeah for everyone out there listening appreciate you guys tuning in uh, but yeah thanks jacomo and um, it's awesome to have you um and i hope that you have an awesome rest of the week and i hope that everyone listening has a great rest of the week as well uh, and remember to buy bitcoin bye everybody okay.